Hello and welcome to another tutorial of ProFlan YouTube channel. In this particular video, we're going to have a practice paper of the May June exams. So as you are preparing for your exams, uh, I need to I need you to take into consideration of looking at some of these topics that are uh, have basically uh, prepared in this case. So we're going to have a candid kind of discussion on how you're supposed to um, approach some of the questions. Uh, that appear in exams and which are the kind of steps you need to follow in order to earn all the marks So in this regard at this particular point if you are new to ProFlan YouTube channel Consider subscribing so that any time I'm going to upload further tutorials you'll be notified So we need to go straight in and get to see exactly what are the questions that um, we are really uh, going to look at we are going to see which are the ex right steps you need to follow in order to answer those particular questions so without wasting much time we need to go straight and dive in so that we can be able to get started all right so we need to go straight to the first part of the question and in this um, particular question I brought in how to expand brackets and for instance how you're supposed to work out brackets when you have three brackets in together so we're going to start by looking at we are going to expand the last bracket first the last bit of the bracket is the one that we are going to focus on and then once we get the answer, then we look at, uh, we multiply the first part of the bracket. So x times x is going to give us x squared and x times 4 is going to give us 4x. So we are going to look at this. The last two brackets, I multiplied x times x and x times 4, which gave me x squared plus 4x. And then minus 5 times x gives me minus 5x then minus 5 times 4 I got negative 20 so I'm going to put the like terms together and this reduces to x squared minus x minus 20 and uh, I'm going to now multiply the first bracket with the answer I've gotten I'll multiply the first term with everything that is in the second bracket and also the second term which is 3 times everything that is in the second bracket so if I open and put the like terms together this is going to reduce to 2x cubed plus um, x squared minus 43x minus 60 as our final answer so get to prepare on how to answer question to do with the uh, three brackets multiplied and this is leading to a cubic uh, function like that huh? expression our next question that you need also to be well prepared on is how to answer question to do with the direct direct and inverse proportions so in this case i have direct proportion whereby i'm told that m varies directly as the cube of h so meaning that the first thing that i need to do is to write that uh, mathematical equation representing that information so if we are saying m is directly proportional it means that m is equals to k a constant times the cube of h and since i'm given 4 and h uh, m equals to 4 and h equals to 0 0.5 this means it will enable me to work out the value of k so at this point i can substitute the value so that i can be able to work out the value of k and in that case, if um, I square 0 0.5, I'm getting 0 .0, uh, 0 0.125 in that case. So 0.125k divided by 0 0.125 both sides this and this one commit suicide. We are going to have our k remaining as 32. So we can now write our formula m equals to h. Uh, 32h cubed that's the formula that is required now we are supposed to find the value of h when m is 500 finding the value of h when m is 500 and in this case you can see m is actually um the subject of the formula so 
because again you may be asked question to do making subjects of the formula for instance this one i'll decide and make h the subject of the formula i'm doing that so that we can be able to get to learn how to make subject to the formula as well from this particular question so i'm going to say making h the subject i'm going to divide 32 both sides so that i'm going to remain with um uh um, uh, if I divide by that two both sides, I'm going to have h cubed equals to m over 32. Then finding the cube root, I'm going to have h equals to the cube root of 32 uh, m over 32. So this is now h being the subject. Then now we can be able to substitute m. And substituting m, uh, m is 500. And then find the cube root for that. We are going to get our answer as 5 over 2. Yeah, if you find the cube root of uh, 500 over 32, you're going to get 125 over 8, of course, after simplifying. And then now finding the cube root of those two numbers, you're going to get 5 over 2, which is equivalent to 2.5. All right. Moving to the next part, we are told that a kite, uh, this is a very interesting question that because we're told that uh, ABCD is a kite with diagonals AC and BD diagram on a centimeter um uh, they are drawn on a they are drawn on a centimeter square grid which has a scale of one centimeter for one unit for each axis uh, so this is the point uh, a is a point of uh, which has the coordinates negative three four and the diagonals of the kite intersect at the point m so remember when the diagonals of a kite intersect they usually form 90 degrees they they, they 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 are perpendicular to each other that is very important for us to continue solving this question given that a b equals to a d and that is equals to 6.5 we are supposed to find the x coordinate of b uh, and the x coordinate of b is positive yeah the x coordinate of b is positive so that uh, we are going to see to know what d is now we are supposed to find the coordinate of the points b and d now, in order to work out this, huh, I need you to um, remember that uh, we had said, okay, let us first draw this. Let's draw this diagram first so that um, we can be able to consider what we are supposed to do. Now, drawing that and we can be able to label this as A, B, C, and D. And then we can be able to draw the diagonals. Remember, they intersect themselves. And they, we have the coordinate m whose coordinate m is whose coordinate is 0 0.0 and 2, 0, 2. Yeah, and then they are forming 90 degrees. So line AM and line BD are actually perpendicular. They are perpendicular. So we can be able to say these are also equal because we were told that is uh, 6.5. Yeah, so we can be able to now proceed and work out the gradient of AM. Yeah, we shall find the gradient of uh, AM, and that gradient of AM is going to enable us work out the equation of um, the equation of the line. So the gradients, remember, gradient is changing y over changing x. So in order to find the gradient, we are going to say four minus two over negative three minus zero, and that's going to translate to negative two over three. But since the two lines are perpendicular, it means m1. Uh, because we want to find the we want to find the gradient of the line that is going through BD, we need to find the equation of the line going through uh, BD. So for us to find that, we need to know the gradient of the line going through BD. Now, since BD and AC are perpendicular, then we're going to use um, m1 times m2 equals to negative 1. Since they are perpendicular, we are going to use this exp expression. And if we work out this, we are going to get our m2 is actually positive uh, 3 over 2. Now, since it, the, the line that's going through BD and we're finding its equation, it means that we are going to use this gradient and the point 0, 2 in order to work out that equation. So. Uh, we are going to say this is going to be y equals to mx plus c. Then we shall substitute uh, the gradient that we have here and the point 0, 2. And you see now we are going to have uh, this line bd, b, bd equals to 
y equals to 3 over 2x, 3 over 2x plus 2, 3 over 2x plus 2. So the next thing that we need to do is now, because we are supposed to find the coordinates of v and d, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a different uh, direction. Huh? I'll take a different direction in that. I'll find now the length of uh, AM and then I'll find the length of uh, BM and I'll find the length of uh, AB. Then I apply Pythagoras theorem so that I can be able to form an equation which we shall solve with the equation that we have found BD. So uh, let me just uh, take you step by step. AM is actually going to be magnitude of AM, the length of AM is going to be 2 minus 4 squared plus 0 minus minus 3 squared. I'm applying the formula for finding magnitude and that becomes 13. I'll also find MB. MB will be Y or X. Huh? X minus 0, that's X squared. X minus 0 squared. Y minus 2 squared. And if I work it out, I'm going to have that expression. Now, using Pythagoras theorem at this particular point, we can now say that uh, the length AM, AM squared plus MB squared is equal to AB squared because that is a right angled triangle. Yeah, So that we can be able to sincerely agree uh, that we can be able to substitute these values that, that uh, those magnitude that we had gotten in the previous step and if you square both sides you are going to get rid of the square roots and then on the right hand side 6.5 which was uh, the length of AB is going to be 42.25 now we can now simplify this and we shall have 29.25 here because if you take that in on the other side this is going to be 42.25 minus 13, which is going to give you 29.25. Are we together up to that point? Yes. So once you have that, remember there's this equation that uh, we had gotten. This equation is going to be solved together with this particular equation that we have here. Yeah. So we are going to substitute. And remember, this was actually x here. So let me just look for more space. Let me go get more space. Yeah. This is what I mean by getting space. No. Let me just do it again. Right. So, okay. So we have this. Huh? These equations, two equations are going to be solved. Yeah. So this x, yeah. This is going to be uh, y equals to 3 over 2x plus 2. And then, which means that uh, if we substitute this anywhere, we have y in, the, in this other equation, we're going to substitute whatever we have here. Now, you can see 2 and 2 will cancel out. And then, we are going to remain with x squared plus 3 over 2x squared. So if we square that guy, we are going to remain with uh, only x. And you see now I'll put the two terms together. And uh, okay, if I add the two terms, I'm going to get 29.25. Then I'm going to multiply by 4 both sides, which is going to give me 117. Then I divide by 13 so that I can remain, remain with x squared equals to 9. So finding the square root you are going to get two answers because when you find the square root of a number you will have either positive or negative. So what does that communicate to us? We have two value of x but remember we were told in this question that x coordinate of b is positive. So meaning uh, b is going to take 3 and d is going to take negative 3. So we need to substitute when we have x, what's the value of y from the first equation that we had gotten. We substitute there, we are going to get 6.5. So meaning b is 3 and uh, 6.5. So we can be able to write it down here just to make the examiner happy. Then we now move to the next part, which is x equals to negative 3. Therefore, we now need to substitute y into this so that we can be able to get it. And if you work it out, just consult your calculator. Let me just get my calculator at this point so that I can be able to see where can, what I can get. So consulting my calculator, I'm getting nothing other than negative 2.5. Right, so we just transfer it here. 
and that's what you are supposed to do in order to work out this particular question so there could be different approaches that you can use in this section but uh, i felt that this one was quite um, straightforward in order to move on so we have the two coordinates for b and d then now we can happily move to the next beautiful question of um, where we are going to apply cosine rule and sine rule so the reason as to why i brought this question here is that uh, for you to get to know how to apply cosine rule you practice how to use sine rule and also finding perimeter of the circle this question also will enable you understand how to work out um, this angle uh, that is properties of uh, the circle theorem here uh, properties of angles in a circle especially angles in a cyclic quadrilateral and also angles in a triangle now we shall see how that is going to unveil as we are going to work out this particular question now let's go ahead let's continue and get to c now we have b we can label this as small b because the angle is labeled as capital b 98 uh, this other uh, is c opposite to the angle c and then we can now say cosine rule using cosine rule we can now say since we are finding b we are going to say b squared equals to a squared plus c squared minus 2ac cosine of capital b b is the angle now we need to substitute everything that we have because we we have our c actually our c is uh, 8 our a is 7.5 our b is 98 we need to substitute those guys into this yeah because b but because b b b b is what b is what yes b is what b is 98 yes let us write it here now substituting everything so that we can be able to work this out for us to find b we need to find the square root because i've just put in everything to the calculator and then now i'm striking to find the cube root the square root of uh, 136.95 which is going to give us which is going to give us what just let's just press on okay so if i work it out i'm getting um 11.7 correct to one decimal place remember the accuracy in um questions in exams so that you can be able to get that grade nine that grade nine so this angle is um actually opposite to the other angle angles opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 so 98 plus 82 gives us 180 so that's why i'm saying d is 82 and the angles in a, a triangle add up to, to 180 degrees also so 82 plus 35 plus a should give us actually um 180 so the property i used to find d was angles opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 so that's why we have that the next bit that uh, we need to do is to find the angle a so um, this angle a all right so using sine rule before okay using sine rule we need we need also to know we can now say we are now considering triangle a c d so that's why you see i'm changing uh 11.7 to be d because i'm referring to this triangle a c d so the opposite side to d is 11.7 the opposite side to c is this line a d so this one here you see this one here is going to be our new a so remember now we are looking at triangle a c d don't be confused why have changed these sides so this part is going to be the angle for a and uh, that is angle in a triangle add up to 180 so if we work out that what we get that is 63 degrees huh? 63 degrees now we can say a over sine 63 equals to 11.7 over 82 sine 82 i'm applying sine rule in order to find the side a so if you work it out and put it in your calculator you are going to get your answer equal to 10.5 centimeters so a is actually 10.5 so we can be able to find c you can say c over sine 35 equals to 
11.7 over sine 82. So if we just work it out this also, we are going to get our answer to be 6.7 centimeters. Now, which means that uh, we can now work out the perimeter. Perimeter is distance all round, adding all the distance around the shape that we are being told. So we shall consider this guy 6.7. We shall consider this guy 10.5. So we are going to add all this uh, 6.78. We add 7.5. We add 10.5 together. So we are going to say our perimeter is going to be, if you add everything, let's just put it using a calculator. This gives me 32.7 centimeters as the perimeter. Now, you'll be given question to do with uh, algebraic fractions like this. And um, in this case, you need to, get rid of the fraction the first thing is to get rid of the fraction and getting rid of the fraction is multiplying by six all through both sides but if you are having two fractions you need to find the 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 the, 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 the you need to find the lcm of the denominators so that you can be able to multiply all through by the lcm so that you get rid of the fractional part so we are going to have a question that will have um, similar to whatever I'm trying to explain. But this one only, we're going to multiply both sides by 6, and then uh, we're going to remain with 2x plus 5 into, equals to 6 into 2x minus 5, then opening the brackets, we're going to have 12x minus 30, and then we shall put the like terms together, uh, we shall have uh, divide by 10 both sides, our final answer x becomes 3.5, 3.5. 3.5. In fact, if you have not subscribed to ProfLearn YouTube channel, you are going to miss a lot because more is coming. So if you are finding value from this particular video, consider subscribing so that anytime we are going to upload new tutorials, you'll be notified. And by so doing also, you'll be, you'll be supporting ProfLearn. Uh, you as a ProfLearner, you'll be supporting of land to grow and also to be recommended by YouTube to other students. So let me give you a chance at this particular point to take a moment, take a moment and uh, subscribe, take a moment, like, like and comment. If uh, you've not subscribed, just take this moment to let me just click on that subscribe button. Just click on it. Like this video. Like it. Leave a comment down below so that end time I'm going to go through it and be able to respond to you. Uh, if there's any request, I can be able to act on it. Just take a moment and subscribe. Right. So let me go back so that we can be able to continue the video. Let me go back. Right. All right. Okay. Now, moving on, moving on with the. Um, the video we are going to see how to do question to do with um, how do you approach question that um, actually deals with uh, indices so if you are having h raised to power 15 divided by h raised to power 3 these two numbers are divided so you are going to subtract the powers uh, subtracting the powers we are going to have this is h raised to power 12 but now when you have a bracket like this, it means this four is going to be multiplied to all the powers of the numbers which are inside the bracket. Don't forget that. So two is, is like raised to power one. So meaning is going to be two raised to power four uh, times one. G is raised to power three. So it's going to be three, three times four. And the K is raised to power five. So it's going to be five times four then 2 raised to power 4 is going to be uh, 16, right? So we're going to have 16, g raised to power 12, and k raised to power 20. So when there is a bracket and there is a power outside, always remember it affects the powers of inside the bracket by multiplying them. You multiply them. But if the power numbers which are multiplied together, uh, the powers are added. If numbers are divided together, and they are having the same base, power are subtracted. You need to understand those conditions. 
So in part D, it's enabling us to see when now you have division, you have one multiplication together. So y power 5 times y power n, those two are going to be added. And then, uh, of course, we are going to divide uh, this y raised to power 7 equals to y raised to power 12. Then, you see, we are going to subtract now 7 there. And then we shall now equate the powers. So n minus 2 equal, should be equal to 12. Because the bases are the same, we can now equate the powers. And say now n minus 2 equals 12, taking n on the other side. And remember, we had said that uh, if uh, a number goes on the other side of the equal sign, uh, it has to change the sign. Even if it goes through the space of the two equal signs, all under, all above, it has to change the sign. So that we are going to have 12 plus 2 equals to 14 as the value of uh, n. Now, you learned about appreciation and depreciation. There's a lot of background noise from uh, the neighboring here. Uh, you can just bear with me. It's going to subside in a few a few seconds. Um, it's not continuing. Uh, so let's look at appreciation and depreciation. Uh, when some commodities appreciate in value and some commodities depreciate in value. So for instance here, this is a board that was bought at $26,800. And the value depreciate at 8% each year. So we're supposed to work out the value of the board at the end of the three years. So you need to use the formula in this case. A equals B into R over 100 raised to power N. This is appreciation, depreciation rather. But if it's appreciation, we were to use addition sign there. So our rate is 8. Our N is actually 3. So substituting into the formula and uh, trying to work out this using our calculator, I'm finding that uh, my answer is uh, 2868.8. Yeah, this is uh, 2868.8. So we were told to give our answer correct to the nearest dollar uh, because after the decimal we have eight, which is greater than five, it means that we are going to have 2686. Yeah, and uh, 8 now becomes 9. So we are going to say this is 20,860 odd. Yeah, so if I just nearest dollar, I'm going to write it as 69, 69, 69. Yeah, this 69, huh? 20,869. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the typing error. So I need to know that. All right, so this becomes 20,869, not 61. Okay, yeah, take note of that. Now, the, um, the graph shows the relationship between Q and T, and uh, we are told that um, uh, T is greater than zero, but less than eight, less than eight, uh, which means that <clears throat> uh, since they are directly proportional, Q is directly proportional to that. We can be able to write the relationship down here, directly proportional. So we are going to say Q is directly proportional to T. We can remove the sign of proportionality by introducing an equal sign, and we shall have a constant there. Now, in order to find the value of K, we are going to go to the graph and select at least some, somewhere. We shall select a point uh, there. So for instance, I can just select this point here. Then I'll have a coordinate, and this coordinate is going to have a value of Q, which is uh, actually 6, and the value of T, which is 4. Then I will now substitute these values back to this equation that I have down here, and this is going to enable me to find the value of K. Now, if I have the value of K, I can now write Q equals to 3 root T. Now, this is the equation that connects, connects Q and T. This is the equation that connects Q and T. But we are told that uh, Q 
is increased by 20%. Find the percentage increase in T. How do we look at this? So since Q and T are connected by this equation, I can decide and make T the subject of the formula. So if I make T the subject of the formula, it means that uh, this is my T equals to Q over 3 uh, actually squared. So which will mean that my T1 is that. Uh, this is my T1. And um, my T1 is going to be Q squared over 9 because 3 squared is going to give us 9. Okay. Once we have this, we are going to find T2, but T2 is after the increase of uh, Q by 20%. If we increase Q by 20%, that becomes 120%. In decimal, that becomes 1 point, uh, actually 2. So this becomes 1.2 over 3 Q over 3 squared. Now, because now the new value of Q is multiplied by 1.2, if I square this in anigans, I'm going to get my answer as um, uh, 0 0.16 Q if I work it out. So to get the percentage change and uh, for T1, if you work out the decimals, you get 0 0.11. T2, you get 0 0.16 Q squared. And now in order to find the percentage change or increase in uh, T, it's actually T2 minus T1 over T1. Yeah, so but our T2 is actually 0 0.16 Q squared. Our T1 was 0 0.11 T squared over our T1, which was 0 0.11 Q squared times 100. If I multiply by 100, let me just move this 100 so that I write it in a percentage. Uh, we work it out and try to simplify things. I can factor out Q squared uh, so that. Um, I can cancel actually q squared will cancel all through and then we are going to have 0 0.16 minus 0 0.11 over 0 0.11 times 100 uh, that's going to actually give us 45 percent 45 percent all right so working out this simplifying this further we are going to get our final answer as 45%. So T, when you increase Q by 20%, T is going to increase by 45%. It also makes the question whether you are supposed to show fractions, checking whether you understand how to work out those questions. And the first thing I decided here is to change the improper fraction. I mix the number to the improper fraction. And when you change a division to a multiplication, you find the reciprocal of whatever that you are having there. Then you can check which number can be divided to simplify this. We realize 3 can divide 27 and 18. And then if I multiply 9 and 7, this is going to give me 63 over 24 and finally this will simplify to 2 5 over 8 all right all right so in question 9 question 9 is going to show us or uh, we are going to use it in order to learn how do you draw a cumulative frequency uh, curve how to draw a cumulative frequency curve and remember sometimes you'll be you'll be given another question whereby you are told to uh, draw histograms. So some of those things that you those are those are some of the things that you need to 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 know. Now here we are given the age of years and the cumulative frequency, but already this question is done because some other question you may not be given the cumulative frequency, but you'll be given the frequency. Then you are expected to work out the cumulative frequency. But this one, the examiner decided to make our life simple. So we are going to plot the points. So you go to 20 and check where you have 13, we move up to this point. For 30, we move up to this point. For 40, we are plotting 42. So 40, we move to 42 is here. All right. Then uh, for 50, we move to 47. 47 is here. We move two steps up, up to that point. And then 60, 52. So we check where 50 is. 60, we move up. 50 is here then 52 should be here 
and then we move to 70 70 we need 56 so 55 is here then 56 must be here and then 80 we move up to 60 60 is at this particular point so we are going to draw we are going to draw a smooth curve that passes through here which is s shaped it's kind of s shaped okay let me see I need to draw it smoothly you need to draw it and um, you see when we say that uh, you need to draw a smooth curve ensure your pencil is sharpened and then join nicely like that yes you are supposed to join to the last bit eh? the yellow one I don't know why my line has jumped you should join to the last bit there so I leave that for you you do it during your exam join to the last point there i don't know why my my, my pen has jumped with that so we have an ogive curve or a, a, a cumulative frequency curve at this point first question use your graph to find an estimate of the median of the ages of these people median median in order to find the median you need to go what was the cumulative total cumulative frequency 60 then that 60 then 60, 60 divided by 2, you get 30. So you draw a straight line from 30 across and check where it's going to meet the graph. Yeah. In order to find the median, you say 60 times, 60 times a half. That's going to be 30. So we are going to draw a beautiful line from here, running across, across, and that down here, we are going to have this point this beautiful point let me check which point is this this point uh read it keenly which point is it so this is around 28 yeah let me zoom a little bit yeah let's count yeah i feel this is actually 20 around 28 yeah the account i can see is around 28 yeah and then we write our uh, 28 is the median then we're supposed to go down and try to estimate the interquartile range and remember, for you to find the interquartile range, you need the upper quartile and you need the lower quartile. Now, in order to find the upper quartile, and the upper quartile is Q what? Yeah, interquartile range. Interquartile range, we need the upper quartile, which is actually Q3. Q3. Q3 is 60 times, uh, yeah, Q3 is 60 times uh, 3 over 4, and that's going to give us 45. So, Q3 is not 45. I want to be very clear here. It's not 45. It's 3 over 5 times the total cumulative frequency. You get the answer. Now, once you get that answer, that's not the answer that you're going to write. You are going to go up on the graph and check where is that 45 that we got after multiplying by a 3 quarters. So you get it. Um, it's by coincidence that this one is actually 45 as well. So this is going to be going down here we're going to check here and it's also 45 huh? it's by coincidence by chance not that uh, when you multiply by three quarters the answer you write you get is what you get no so q3 is 45 and this 45 is the one that you read right from your graph then we need to find also q1 the inter uh, the the lower quartile actually 60 times a quarter is going to give us 15 so you go to where you have 15, the cumulative part, frequency part, then you draw a line to this point, you join. So our Q1 is here. It's actually around 21. It's around 21. Yeah, so we can be able to say this is 21. Then we can be able to write Q1 is 21. Then now we can be able to find that the quartile range is Q3 minus Q1, which is going to be... Uh, translating to 24 right here 24 all right so we have this now you are told to use your graph to find the estimate of the number of these people who are older than 55 55 so meaning you are going to go to 55 on the x-axis check and draw a straight line from there 55 so because age is in the x-axis you go to where we have 55 mm -hmm. age is 55 here so we move to where then you draw you go across so if you read this keenly i'm seeing this is uh, approximately 49 
let me just zoom a little bit so that we can be able to open our eyes widely this is going to be around 49 so because we needed older than 55 so it's uh, 60 minus 49 and that's going to give us 11 people who are having a, a, an age of that 11 people now we need to change the gear to question 10 we're sup supposed to describe fully a single transformation that maps a onto b a transformation that maps a to b you need to look at is as the size changed yes the size has changed as it becomes smaller or larger b is the image yeah? and b is bigger than the object so meaning this is an enlargement so when you are describing fully an enlargement what you need to remember is that uh, you must state the enlargement scale factor and also you must state the center of enlargement uh, when you are explaining or describing fully a rotation you must state the center of rotation and also you must state the angle of rotation when you are describing fully a translation you must state the translation vector uh, when you are describing fully a reflection you must state the mirror line or the line of reflection but in this case we are having an enlargement so we are going to state the center of enlargement and also the enlargement scale factor so for you to get the center of enlargement you are going to join two corresponding points so for instance i decide and uh, join uh, this point and this point yeah and also i'll join this point this point so that i can see where the two lines joining the two points are going to meet where the two lines are meeting that gives us the center of enlargement and um, so we are going to say is an enlargement scale factor three so let me just write it this is an enlargement scale factor scale factor three and the center of enlargement is actually three zero so i'm getting this uh, the um, scale factor or right let me just uh, uh for you to get the um, scale factor look at the number of boxes for instance the base of triangle a is one box but the base of triangle b is how many boxes three of them so meaning a has multiplied three times bigger so it becomes three times bigger so that's why i'm having the scale factor three you can even use the height the height of a is actually two boxes but the height of b is six boxes so you find that uh, a has been multiplied three times uh, in this particular transformation all right the second uh, part the second part is uh, actually talking about uh, on the grid on the grid above translate triangle a by vector negative 4 3 now this is a translation so i'm going to move the x coordinate i'm more, i'm going to move a point in the horizontal direction four steps backwards and i'll take take that particular point three steps upward because it's negative four so i'm going to move horizontally i'm going to move uh four steps behind four steps behind and from that point i'll also move three steps up so i'll come to that point so that point becomes here the second point that i have is this point at this point here yeah i'll move four steps behind one two three and then i'll move up three steps and the last point i have is this one i'll move four steps behind and then i'll move three steps up so i'll have my points like that and then i'll join it like that so my image after that translation is this one here so there's another way you can be able to do it you can read the coordinate you can also read the coordinate of a point like this one this coordinate uh, is actually five one five one this point is five one this one here 5 1 plus the translation vector which is negative 4 3 if you add the two you are going 5 plus negative 4 is going to be 1 
and uh, 1 plus 3 you are going to get 4. You see now the image of that point after that translation is going to be 1, 4. You can see now that 1, 4 is actually at this particular point. You can do the same for all the points and then you get the image. So it's depending what you'll find comfortable with. But uh, according to that, I say that you move negative four steps, four steps behind in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction, you move three steps up because it was positive three. All right, uh, moving to the next question. Part of the curve, part of the curve is shown on the grid y equals to f of x is shown on the grid and we're supposed to find the gradient of the curve at the point where x is 2 so finding the gradient of a curve is actually is like finding the gradient of a tangent at that particular point so we are going to find the gradient of the tangent the gradient of the curve is going to be equal to the gradient of the tangent so at this point i'm going to draw a tangent like that and working out the gradient of this tangent it will be equivalent to the gradient of the curve. So gradient of a tangent is change in y over change in x. And in this case, uh, my change in y, I can see is around 2. Yeah, change in y is actually 2. And change in x, I can count the small boxes, is going to be 0 0.9. Yeah, you can choose any point and use them, the one that you can easily read. So um, I've selected that, so meaning that... Uh, once I work out this, I'm getting the gradient is going to be actual change in y over change in x, which is going to be 2 over 0 0.9, and that's going to be approximately 2.2. .2. So you can use any different points, but the answer you are going to get has to be close to that. Now, moving further to some other part, we are going to talk about inequalities, how you can be able to shade the regions satisfying given and uh, the given inequalities. So those are very, very common questions that uh, don't miss in an exam. So the first one is x is greater than or equal to 1.5. So we need to draw first the line uh, x equals to 1.5 is a vertical line that passes through the x-axis 1.5. So this is the line that's going to go uh, to like that because we are saying greater than all equal to 1.5 meaning we're going to shade the required region is the front part huh? so i'll mark that and the next one is um is y is greater than all equal to x first i need to draw the line uh y equals to x y equals to x is a line that is going to pass through this point one one 2, 2, like that, 3, 3, like that. So it's a line that's going to pass through like that. Huh? So which means that um, we have this uh, line here. Yeah. So for me to know which point I need to shade for this line, I'm going to select a point in either side. Okay, I'm going to select a point in either side of the line. Now, for instance, because I need to ask myself, for the line Y is greater than or equal to X, which side do I shade? I'll have to select a point either side. Now, for instance, I've selected this point here. So I'm going to ask myself, is this a true point? Is this point going to be true or false? If it's true, I'm going to shade where this line is, this point is. But if it's false, I'm going to shade the opposite sign. So let's uh, substitute. Eh? So because we are talking about y dash x, y greater than x. So let me identify that coordinate. That coordinate is 2, 3. So that's going to be 2, 3. So you can see 3 is greater than 2. So meaning this region is true. This uh, with the point where I've selected is a, a true region. So I'm going to shade this side. Uh, so take note of that. So let me just move to the next one is uh, x plus y is less than 6. But we need first to draw the line y the line x plus y equals to 6 first before we put the inequality. But it's not easy to just look at this line and then just plot it because, because um, we need a table. It will be easier. Even for the first one, we, we could even use a table for x equals to y. You see now, this, since this is x, y, x equals to y is 0, if x is 1, y is 1, that one is straightforward, we saw that. Uh, this one also, we need to have a table for the second one. If you draw a table like x and y, then if you say your x is 0, what would be the value of y? Because 
we are drawing the line y plus x plus y equals to 6. So if uh, x is 0, then y is going to be 6. If we say x is 4, then y must be 2. Yeah, so that uh, 4 plus 2 is 6. Then we're going to plot this point 0, 6. If you plot 0, 6 here, and you plot 4, 2 here, then we are going to have what? We are going to have a straight line that is passing like that. And then we shall now uh, try to know which region are we going to shade. Remember, we are using the point 2, 3, the one that we had decided. Then we try to put it there. You can see now x plus y should be less than 6. Let's put that point 2, 3 and see whether is it going to satisfy this equation. If it satisfy, this is the region that we're going to shade. So that's going to be 2 plus 3 is going to be 5. Is 5 less than or less than 6? Yes. So this region is true. So we can now say the required region for all the inequalities is that particular part. So this is the required region. Understood how to go about that? All right. Okay, moving to question number 13. Question number 13 is uh, a question to do with the um, first term. And we are told the height of uh, a large cone is 15 centimeters. The radius of the base of the large cone is 6 centimeters. The radius of the base of the small cone is X. So given that the volume of the first term is 4212 over 25 pi centimeter cubic, we are supposed to find the value of um, x. We are supposed to work out the value of x. Now, in order to work out this, we are going to use the concept of volume over a cone. And at the same time, we are going to apply the concept of uh, linear scale factor, area scale factor factor and volume scale factor. Basically, we are going to use linear scale factor, uh, factor and volume scale factor. So that means that uh, we are going to... So the first thing that we're going to do in this part, we're going to work out the volume of uh, the big cone because the volume of the big cone is going to be obtained from the radius 6 and the height 15. So this will mean that... Uh, uh, volume of uh, a cone is going to be given by the formula, okay? And specifically, we're talking of the big cone. Uh, we are going to substitute what we have, radius, and the 15th height. So if we work it out, we're going to get 180, 180 pi centimeter cubic. Then we're not going to now find the linear scale factor. Because the radius of uh, the big cone is 6, the radius of the small cone is, uh, is x, so the linear scale factor is 6 over x. Then we can work out the volume scale factor is actually a uh, linear scale factor cubed. Then this is going to be equivalent to 216 over x cubed. And um, that becomes, that becomes, uh, we can now say volume scale factor formula is usually volume of the big cone over volume of the small cone. And uh, since we have the volume scale factor as 216 over x cubed, uh, we are going to say it's 180 pi over the volume of the small cone that we don't know. The volume of the small cone, we don't know it. So we are going to try to make v small to be the subject of the formula. So which means that our volume of the small cone is 5 over 6 x cubed pi. Then we can now, let me just look for more space so that I can be able to write. And then we can now, because volume of a first term is usually the difference of the small cone and the big cone, then we can be able to subtract the two and try to find the value of x. And remember, pi and pi can commit suicide. And then we're going to remain with uh, 180 minus 4212 over 25 equals to 5 over 6 per x cubed. So I'm trying to see if I can be able to make x the subject of the formula and then find the cube root both sides. In this case, we're going to have x cubed equals to, um, equals to if you work out this, huh? you are going to get uh, 120, uh, 1728 over 125. 
and then if we find the cube root both sides also we are going to get our answers 12 over 5 12 over 5 which means our answer is 2.2.4 as the value of x now another question that uh, you cannot really miss uh, in an exam is question to do with uh, composite functions and also finding the inverse of uh, a function and in this part we're going to find the inverse of uh, a quadratic equation uh, which is going to make use of completing the square so let us start it off um we are finding the function um state the value of x which uh, where state the value of x can which cannot be included in the domain of g so remember anytime you have this kind of question the value of x that can be excluded if there was a square root we are going to exclude the values which give us negative inside the square root but if you have a fraction you are going to exclude values which are going to give you a zero at the denominator so a denominator can never be equal to zero so we're going to say that value is going to be 2x minus 9 equals to zero making x the subject we're going to get that is 45. if you take 4.5 rather 4.5 and multiply to 9 to 2 you are going to get 9 9 minus 9 0 so we are going to uh, completely disregard disregard the value that is going to give us a zero denominator now finding fg of 4 uh, first we are going to, to okay let me just move this a little bit yeah so this is the value we got I'm finding the composite function fg of 4. fg of 4, I'll start from the inner function. The inner function is g of 4. And actually, g of 4, I'm going to take the function g alone and then substitute for anywhere I have x. And if I work out, I'm going to get negative 5. This negative 5 I've, I'm got, I'm, I've gotten, I'm going to put it in the function f of x so that i can be able to get negative 18 here and that's what we are supposed to do the function h the function h is such that h maps x to 3x squared minus 12x plus 8 where x is greater than 2 express the inverse function h inverse or in the form h inverse is that so the first thing that we need now in order to express that this as an inverse the first thing we need to do is to change this function h of x to y so we are going to say this is y equals to 3x squared minus 12x plus 8 but you are told that um, the domain was given x is greater than 2. So the domain of uh, the function becomes the range of the inverse function. So the range of the inverse function y is going to be greater than 2. This is our range. Now, remember when you are finding the inverse of a function, the first thing you need to do is to switch x and y. So we're going to where you have y, you write uh, x. Where you have x, you write y. So that I'm going to have x equals to 3y squared minus 12y plus 8 then because this is a quadratic i cannot be able to make y the subject direct i have to complete the square now in order to complete the square here i'm going to factor 3 out so if i factor 3 i'm going to remain with y squared minus 4y then plus 8 now if, um, in order to complete the square of this part you are going to take just a single y then minus a half of this number a half of four is actually two then now you enclose the bracket to say squared then you must subtract because if you expand this number here you are going to get positive four so you that's why we are subtracting because it wasn't here in this particular part so we have to subtract it but remember this now is under 3 so this 3 is going to affect everything that we have completed this the square so this is going to give us what 4 here and then if we open now the bracket this is going to be 4 times 3 is going to be 12 at this point 12 plus 8 is going to give us negative 4 which we have here now here since you see we are having a single y we can be able to make 
y the subject and then we can now say this can be written in that form we can take four on the other side it becomes positive and divide by three both sides yeah we divide by three both sides we're going to have um, x plus 4 over 3 then we can now find the square root and then we shall have plus all minus plus all minus now this is where because inverse function can have to cannot have cannot have two uh, signs or, or two possibilities so this is where now this range that we were talking about here is going to help us because y has to be greater than 2 so for y to be greater than 2 then it means this value has to be added because if you subtract anything from 2 it's going to be less than 2 so since we want y to be greater than 2 we're going to take the positive sign so our inverse becomes h inverse of x is mapping x to 2 plus root of x plus 4 over 3 as our final answer so that is what you're supposed to do in those kind of questions in question number 15 a solid sphere has a radius of um, 2.8 centimeters correct to one decimal place the sphere has a mass of uh, m pi grams where m equals to 260 correct to two significant figures we're supposed to work out the upper bound of the density of the sphere and give your answer uh, correct to two decimal places now in um, this part uh, whenever you are working up the upper bound and the lower bound of uh, given variables you need to understand how the the variables affect each other so um, remember that uh, density equals to mass of uh, volume so if we we'll be working out the upper bound so density upper bound is going to be mass because we have the numerator and denominator so the number at the top which is the mass must be upper bound but the 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 volume must be the lower bound for us to get that which means that uh, for us to get volume lower bound radius must be also the lower Bound because for us to get that it has to be the radius has to be a lower bound in that so I need to develop a table to identify the quantities that we have here we have mass and the accuracy for mass was given uh, we have the least unit and also we have uh, the absolute error absolute error is what's added or subtracted so in this case we are given the accuracy for mass is two significant figures radius is one decimal place so the least unit for two significant figures is actually 10 and the least unit for radius which is one decimal place is 0 0.1 now for you to get the absolute error when you know that uh, is the least unit divided by 2 here it will be 5 and here it will be 0 0.05 so our absolute error is going to be plus all minus 5 for mass plus all minus for radius and remember because we are working out the boundaries if we want the upper bound you are going to add the absolute error if you are finding the lower bound you are going to subtract the absolute error so density upper bound is going to be 265 pi because it was m pi and uh, mass was 6 260 so meaning we're going to add 5 to get the upper bound and the volume of a sphere is pi r squared I, I, for pi 4 over 3 pi r cubed then since the radius was actually a 2.8 we're going to sub subtract the absolute error which is 0 0.05 which is going to give us 2.75 and then we cube this so that we can be able to cancel pi and if we work it out if we work out this the upper bound of density we're going to get 9.56 grams per centimeter cubic grams per centimeter cubic we are given different graphs some have seen uh, questions asking you to identify whether you understand different graphs here the first one if i can look at it keenly it, it represents um, 
a cubic function because it has uh, two turning points and it also cut the x-axis at three points. B represents an inverse frank, um, graph, in, inverse graph, yeah, uh, which is y equals to one over x something. And the second one represents, C represents, um, this is sine graph. D represent kind of a quadratic, uh, E represent a cosine graph, and F represent negative of uh, the sine graph. So um, we are supposed to merge this graph that we have here so that this C, uh, this one represent this one, and we can also say cubic is A, yeah? What about the other, this quadratic, this is a uh, cosine, and this is the just positive inverse. Huh? because um, f is a reflection on uh, the other part. Question number 17, find the highest common factor. And the uh, highest common factor, you just uh, need to draw a table like this and then identify what you are given. Then check the factors that can divide these numbers. The least factor is 2, which gives uh, 100, and here is 210. 2 can also divide this, which will be going to give us uh, 50 and 105. I can see 5 can divide this. I get that. Huh? When Once you reach there, if you are finding HCF, highest common factor, you are going to stop there uh, because there's no any other common factor in 10 and 21. Then now HCF is going to be 2 times 2 times 5, which is going to be 20. Uh, you can also be given questions to find LCM when you are given a uh, product of uh, prime factors. And in that case, it's very straightforward. Don't stress yourself. Uh, Prof. Lan uh, got you. So we are going to write just a note here. When finding LCM, when finding LCM, what do you do? What do you do? Just check and see all the factors. Pick all the factors and pick the highest power of each of the factor. Yeah, so that's a note for you. So all factors must appear and pick the highest power. So our main factors for LCM of A, B, and C, remember, in A we have factor 2, so we can, and uh, even if it doesn't appear in C, you are going to take it by force because you are finding the LCM. We pick factors 2, factor 3, factor 5, factor 7, and factor 11. Once you have picked all those factors, so long as they appear in any of them, you pick uh, that factor. Then you are going to pick now the highest power for each of them. 2 has the highest power, 3. 3 has the highest power, 2. 5 has the highest power, 2. 7 has the highest power, 2. And 11 has the highest power, 1. So that becomes our LCM because you are supposed to give your answer in powers of the prime factors. You leave it there like that. So let me just move it a little bit down here. No extra mark for that, but that's meant to make the examiner happy. All right. All right. So we need to move to the next. I don't know why um, we are having also indices here, but uh, it's great that uh, it will make us realize what you are supposed to do in that case. Eh? This is the same as 32 is going to be reset. Yeah. Yeah, I'm being disturbed a little, a little bit here. So we can continue with question number 18. So, which means that uh, if you raise 32 by 3 over 5, that is the same as 50 root of um, 32, which is actually 2, then you square, you raise to power 3, that 2, you, you are going to get 8. And uh, A raised to power 15, since 15 is a power and uh, 3 over 5 is a power outside, we are going to multiply 15 times 3 over 5 and in order to simplify that. So this is exactly what we're going to have. And uh, this is going to beautifully simplify to uh, this expression 8 a raised to power 9. Very beautiful. Very interesting. Very interesting. So if they're going to set a question to do it, a negative power, 
already we know what to do you are going to find the reciprocal of what's inside the 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 the, 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 the you are going to find the reciprocal of what's inside the you are going to find the reciprocal of of you are going to find the reciprocal of what is inside the bracket and that's going to be 10x and then we're going to get rid of negative num uh, sign so this is going to be uh, 10x raised to power 3 now since we have removed the reciprocal now we have uh, 3 as a positive then we can raise to 3 every term that is inside the bracket and that's going to be 1000 raised to power x power 3 and then we are done remember when we started this video i did mention that uh, sometimes you may be told to solve algebraic fractions algebraic fractions algebraic fractions algebraic fractions whereby you have more than one fraction in this case we are going to find the lcm of all the denominators and then we multiply all through every term and the lcm here is 30 multiplying all through by every term and then putting the like terms together that is going to simplify to uh, this eh? then opening the bracket and uh, putting the like terms together we can now say this expression is going to reduce to 10y equals to 29 then now divide by, uh, yeah 29 so if you divide by 10 both sides uh, y is going to translate to 2.9 as our the final answer and um, as we are trying to wrap up and uh, because we can we we are not sure which kind of question can be asked you may be given in the part of inequalities you may be given a shaded region or, and then you are supposed to come up with the inequalities that satisfy this region the previous question that we did we we were looking at how to uh, graph the inequalities but this one is how to get the inequalities from the graph so which will mean that you can be able to identify the first the, the first lines this one this one is uh, quite easy because x is greater than all or equal to 2 that one is quite straightforward this line that comes horizontally through 2 and the vertical line this one is also quite easy x is uh, less than all equal to 6 the other one that is a bit um, funny is this one which we need to find the gradient and then use the gradient in order to, in order to find this but this line is quite straightforward forward because uh, x is 1 y is 1 when x is 2 y is 2 when x is 3 y is 3 so you can see now this is the equation y equals to x so the only problem that we have is to identify which inequality are we going to use at this particular point now to find the inequality we're going to select a point inside the shaded region r and put it in the equation y equals to x and check when y dash x so the x coordinate is 4 y coordinates 3 so this is 3 dash 4 yeah so just a minute just a minute it cannot just behave like this cannot behave like an a hooligan uh, just jumping like that huh? so if we say y dash x you can see y is 3 yeah y is 3 but uh, x is uh, 4 so the inequality in that point is y is less than all equal y is less than all equal to x that's the inequality that we supposed to use at that particular point question 20 here are the numbers of aces uh, that uh, raja served in each of the 11 tennis matches 1 1 2 4 6 8 8 9 11 12 15 find the intercuta range intercuta range is going to be obtained uh, as follows q3 minus q1 so but we need to find the median and the median is actually going to be because 11 we shall have five values to the lower part and five values in the upper part so the median is going to be eight this is the median so we are going also to find the middle point of uh, the lower and the upper part so this is going to be lower quartile this is going to be the upper quartile three so intercoater range is q3 minus q1 which is going to be actually 11 minus 2 and if you work it out you are going to get the answer 9 now 
here is uh, the point I need you to be very attentive and be very keen as see if your life depends on this. Now, because you need to understand what really does the range communicate to us about data. We need to know what does the interpreter range communicate to us about data. What does the value of the media, um, the range median and interpreter range communicate? Kim also plays 11 tennis matches. For Kim, the median number of the SS is 11. But the median for the other one was 8. Remember, uh, the intercooter range for, for him is, for her actually, is, uh, she is 5. But the other one here we can see is 9. All right, state and give a reason whether Raja or Kim served more aces uh, on average. So for you to, 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 to say here, you need to look at the median. Eh? If the median is larger on uh, the individual person, it means that the person who served more. So we are going to say that uh, Kim, yeah, actually this is uh, Kim because first let us write that note I've indicated. Uh, higher range, higher range means what? Data is more spread out. Data is more spread out. So meaning if a student does some test and in ex ex examination we have a higher range, it means this student is not, is uh, scores very high marks and a very low marks in other subjects. So the, the data is quite spread out uh, because of some given outliers. Higher median means it tells us that the data values are higher. So if the median in a class is high, it means many students scored, uh, did well, or there is higher data in that particular part. So higher interquartile range is telling us, it's going to tell us that the data is spread out and it's inconsistent, inconsistent. So those are some of the things that you need, you really need to understand in order to answer this question. So we can say Kim served more essays because he has, she has, she has a, a larger or a higher median. The second case uh, was more, who was more consistent between Kim and Raja? Uh, who was more consistent? Consistency, we need to look at the smaller intercooter range. So again, we are going to say Kim, uh, it's Kim because he has a small intercoatile range. I believe you've understood in that particular part. Now moving to kinematics, that is uh, integration, uh, integration, uh, actually integration differentiation. And this is particle moving along a straight line that passes through a fixed point O, the displacement S meters of the particles from O at time T second is given by S uh, 2T cubed minus 5T squared plus 6T minus 5. Find the value of T when the acceleration of the particle is actually 5 meter per second square. In this one, you need to find, differentiate this. If you differentiate a, a, a displacement function, you are going to get velocity. So V is ds dt. Differentiating that, we are going to get 60 squared minus 10t. And uh, then um, plus 6. Then acceleration is differentiating the previous part that we have obtained. So this is going to be 12t minus 10. 12t minus 10. So... Since we are finding the value of t when the, the, the acceleration of the particle is 5 meter per second square, we are going to equate this particular part to uh, 5. Then we try to make t the subject of the formula. And then if you work it out, you are going to get your answer is t, which is 1.25 seconds. And this marks the end of uh, this particular video, which means that uh, we started, we started, we started and we have come to the end. So if you joined us, you joined us uh, earlier. Uh, remember, we started by saying there is more and there is yet more to come in Proflan. So if um, you are new to Proflan YouTube channel, consider sub subscribing. Just press that uh, subscribe button uh, so that end time we are going to upload further tutorials, you be notified. So maybe I can hear from you. Um, I've just, I was sitting here doing all this. I'm now done. I can go and try to
have um have some coffee and if you are new don't forget to subscribe leave a comment if the video was helpful if there's anything that you are expecting after this after this video just leave a comment down below i'm just waiting so that i can be able to respond to comments see you in the next video